Hello, my name's Keith Rucker. So for tonight, I've got you guys an episode I'm going to put together of just a couple of miscellaneous things. This is mostly going to be a shop talk type video, although I do have a couple of uh, clips I'm going to put in here from some things I've done out at the, at the shop museum, at the museum shop uh, over the last week or so that I just haven't gotten into a video yet. Um, just some shorter clips, I guess, really on some things. Um, but this is going to mostly be a talking video of me telling you about some stuff that's going on, showing off some new things we got. Uh, so, and I've, again, I've, I've heard comments from you guys. Some of you people don't like these, some of you guys do like them. Uh, I'm going to keep doing them because there's enough of you out there to say you do like them uh, that we're going to keep on doing them. But if you're looking for all machine shop action, uh, you probably need to go look at one of my other videos. And, and I'm going to probably put shop talk in the title of this one. And, and from now on, when it's a shop talk type, uh, episode. I'm going to put that in the title. And that was a suggestion that came from some of you guys uh, so that you guys can kind of figure out the content of uh, what, we're, what we're talking about. So I'm going to start out by talking about this new cabinet that I'm leaning on right here. This is something I'm really kind of excited uh, to have picked up here in the last week or so. And I had mentioned before that I've been looking for a good cabinet to put my taper shank drill bits in. And uh, for you guys that subscribe uh, to my channel and been watching me for a while, you know uh, several months ago I started trying to put together a good collection of taper shank drills. And uh, many of you guys out there were kind enough to send me uh, extras that you had. And uh, I was able to put together a very nice set of uh, taper shank drills. I still got a couple that I'm looking for, but for the most part, you know, I'm in good shape on, on uh, taper shank drills now. Uh, but really one of the biggest challenges I had was keeping them organized and where I could get to them very easily and not have to dig through a big pile uh, to find the size I'm looking for. So uh, uh, I, I was doing some research and I, I, I saw this cabinet right here made by Hewitt, H-U-O-T. Uh, they pronounce that Hewitt, uh, but they make all kinds of cabinets for storing different kinds of tooling and what have you in. And I have a bunch of their smaller cabinets for, I got one that I have drill bits in, one with taps in it, and one for end mills uh, to kind of keep them all organized. And I've always liked them. Well, this is a bigger cabinet, a little bit heavier duty. It's got the uh, ball bearing slides in the drawers. Oops, I locked it. Uh, let me unlock it. This one has a key on it. My other ones you can't lock up. This one you can lock up. A real nice cabinet here. Uh, and this one is actually built for holding uh, taper shank drills. And uh, it goes basically from an eighth of an inch up to one inch. You can store all those bits. Uh, in this cabinet by 64th inch increments. All right, so we'll get you zoomed in here a little bit closer where you can take a better look at this. So it's got four drawers on it. Uh, the top drawer starts out at an eighth inch and goes up to uh, 31 64 And there's a little compartment in here for every size drill bit. And there's actually room in here for more than one drill bit of each size. So if you have multiples, uh, you can keep them in here. So I start out, yeah, I, I thought I had this one. I'm missing a 530 seconds, so I'm going to have to find me one of those to fill out my collection. I think I've got all the other sizes in here, or have the other sizes anyway. Uh, and you can see these are starting out with number one tapers. Uh, about here at, what is that, three-eighths or so, I just go up to a number two size taper. And some of these I have both the one and two in there, um, and just all the way up. So real nice, nicely organized something that I can easily go, if I'm looking for a quarter inch drill bit, I can just go pull it right out and then put it back up when I'm through. Uh, next drawer down, this one goes from a half inch up to three quarters of an inch. Yeah, I've got an empty slot here, but actually I have that 9 16 bit. It's just, it's too long to fit in this cabinet. So I'm probably gonna find me a shorter one uh, that'll fit in here. I like that long bit. I'm sure it'll come in handy one day. I don't wanna cut it down, but uh, anyway, I've got all these in here now up to three quarter in this drawer. And again, uh, there's room in here for multiples. And some of these, these are like number two and number three taper shanks on some of these. Uh, go down to the next drawer. We start out at, uh, was that 49 and go to 2730 seconds, I think that is. And uh, these, they turn them the other way uh, just because the length of the bits are getting too long to go in there the other, uh, straight on. And uh, for whatever reason, I guess they just had too many, um, more than enough room in here. But on these, there's actually two slots for each size. Um, so, I've, uh, you know, I've got them all in here, but 
there are some empty places. I actually had some doubles on some of these, so I went ahead and, and uh, put those in here. And I think I'm gonna get my little label maker and put it down here in the bottom where I know which bit goes where. Uh, Cause right now you have to look on the front and it's just not real convenient. Uh, and then in the bottom drawer down here, the last drawer, uh, it's a little bit deeper. And again, this one is from 55, 64 up to one inch. And on these, you got basically one slot for each size, but they're a little bit bigger. Um, and anyway, that works out real good. And like I said, I've got pretty much every size except for that one little tiny uh, drill bit. So I feel like I got me a pretty good deal on this. These cabinets, if you buy them new, um, you know, I've seen them anywhere from about $350 up to about five or $600 for some of these sizes. Uh, this one I actually got from a, uh, I think this would maybe in a display. Uh, it, it's got a few little scratches on nothing bad. It, it does have a little rock to it. Uh, I'm gonna have to put a wedge up underneath the back, but I got this one for about 200 bucks with shipping is about 250. So, uh, um, anyway, I'm, I'm real happy with it. I mean, it's basically brand new, uh, but I got a, uh, what I felt like was a pretty good price on it uh, for a new cabinet. Uh, I was trying to find a used one. I just never could find one for sale. Uh, but anyway, I was pretty happy with the deal I got on this. And this will give me a nice place to keep all these stored. Uh, these will go out to the museum uh, where I can use them with the lathe and what have you uh, and have them all handy. And again, this goes up to one inch. My bigger ones I've got, I'm going to have to store in a cabinet somewhere. I don't have a, a cabinet like this to put them in, but I'll just probably put them in my toolbox in the drawers. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm excited to have my taper shanks a better organized now. All right, we're going to go ahead and install the height adjustment screws in this piece here. So uh, we've already got all the holes and everything drilled out. So um, this one's just going to drop in on this side. The little bushing that we've did goes to the top of this and that keeps it from coming out any further. Uh, once we get in there, we'll install this little uh, Woodruff key. And the sprocket then goes on. And we'll tighten that up. All right, I've got the chain in here now, and uh, what I need to do is I need to cut this chain and then uh, splice it together. And I've got it in here, and I can tell that what we need to do is we need to take this uh, this little link right here out, this little half link, and uh, this between these two, and we'll replace it with this one that's adjustable that we can put in here. Uh, so what we need to do is, is actually get this one off. And to do that, I've got this handy little uh, tool here that... Uh, just kind of pushes that little thing right out. Let me back that all the way off. Make sure I'm getting the right one here. So this just kind of pinches in up underneath that chain. And there's just a little screw and a little uh, center-like piece in there. And we're just going to take it and we're just going to push it out. And basically that's just going to knock that link loose with the top there. Okay, and then we're going to do the same thing on the other side. All right. So now that's off. We can see we uh, basically just took that link out. And now we're going to put the link in between here to connect these chains together. All right, so now we got this ready to go together. And uh, here's the link I'm gonna put in. And I think this is gonna be just a little bit too tight for me to get it right here, but no big deal. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna pull uh, 
both of these sprockets up. At least I say I am. All right, so what I'm doing is I'm sliding this chain out because it's just a little bit tight and um, I need a little bit of extra space here to get it. So by, by doing this, I got a little more flex in my, in my chain because these uh, sprockets or these uh, rods have got just enough play in there where it's going to uh, allow me to get that on there. So we'll drop that piece on and then the little clip. Tell you what, let's uh, go ahead and flip this back up now. Make sure it's going to go all the way back down. And get these lined up with the key. There we go. And this clip clips right in place and voila, chain is installed. I also want to give you guys a quick update on the safe restoration. Um, so I had a lot of comments first off from you guys about this uh, material in the bottom of the safe here that was exposed as it probably contains asbestos. This is a fireproofing material and you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm sure that it probably does. However, because it is bound up in a, this concrete type material, uh, the asbestos fibers are trapped and it's not something that's going to be coming out. So as long as I'm not over here uh, sanding on it, uh, grinding on it, chipping on it, creating dust, uh, it, it is relatively safe uh, because the asbestos is actually trapped in this. So, uh, but I did take the advice of one of my viewers out there. He said, take some polyurethane and coat the bottom and that will help seal the surface and keep any dust from coming off of it. I didn't have any polyurethane handy, but I did have some little spray shellac over there and I gave it a really good coating. In fact, a couple of coatings and and that should have all this sealed in there. And two notice that I've come in here and I've, I'm working on getting this bottom patched up. I got some castable uh, refractory cement to put back in here and uh, this is drying right now. It's still a little bit wet, but uh, um, we're gonna be out of town for a couple of days. So hopefully when I get back, this will be nice and hard and uh, I'll give it another coat of shellac just to coat it all up real good and it'll be ready to cover up. So this is the uh, metal plate uh, that will cover all this up on the bottom. It just screws on and uh, as you can see it's kind of rusty. Uh, it was really beat up and bent up pretty bad. I did take it out and uh, lay it on a on the welding table and just kind of hammered it out and it's still got a little bit of warp to it but I think when it gets screwed down it's going to be fine and I think just to keep it original I'm going to put this back on. Uh, I think that'll be good to keep it on there. This is on the bottom of the safe so it's not really something that's going to be seen, so I'm not too worried about it. So we'll get this cleaned up and painted and uh, put it back on here. And one more comment on the, the safe restoration. I, I've had a lot of comments from you guys, my viewers out there, who are telling me, don't paint it, don't strip it off. Keep the patina that's on here. Well, guys, um, I hate to tell you, but this isn't really what I would consider patina. Uh, you zoom in on this thing and uh, guys, that's just rust. Uh, this thing is in pretty ratty shape, particularly on the outside. Um, I really don't see a way that I can realistically uh, save this thing uh, without doing a, a full-blown restoration on it, uh, including stripping off the old paint and uh, giving it a good paint job. So. Um, yeah, I don't know what your definition of patina is, but this is uh, beyond my definition of patina. So this is gonna be completely restored and repainted. Uh, you know, the inside of the safe, I'm gonna at least explore the possibilities of trying to save that. 
Um, but even there, there's enough big, huge scratches and stuff on the original paint that I imagine that when we get the outside looking real nice, I don't want to open the door up and it just, it not match. So I'm probably just going to redo the whole thing and uh, take it back to original, put the original pinstriping back on it. Uh, the door to this, again, uh, is, isn't here right now, but it's got dings in it where it was hit with a hammer. Uh, the, the actual front of the door, they re somebody repainted it and it's got runs running down it. You can see the pinstriping showing through in a few places under the paint. This is not a candidate for saving in my opinion. So we're going to, uh, we're going to just strip it down and, and start over. So a couple more things in this episode. Uh, I also just want to comment a little bit on these uh, these castings here. You know, this is something we showed in one of my previous videos where we're going to send these off and use these as actual patterns. These are for a follower rest on the Lodge and Shippy lathe where someone let me borrow their original and we're going to make a new one using these old parts as patterns to have them cast. And I mentioned that I got to do some prep work to these. Uh, to get them ready to send to the foundry and many of you guys have commented that you want to make sure you see that uh, don't worry i plan on shooting a video on that when the time comes i haven't had a chance to do it yet uh, but hopefully in the next week or two we'll have time to uh, uh, get this prepped out and ready to go and when i do i will shoot a video on it and let you guys uh, see that process and i also want to just uh, comment uh, on the two items these this pair of brown and sharp uh, 499 or 599 calipers and this uh, Sterrett uh, number 196 back plunge indicator. These are both uh, some items that are kind of extras for me. I talked about this in my uh, one of my uh, former videos and, and I said I'm going to offer these up for trade. So if you guys have something you think I might want, uh, you know, maybe we can do a little horse trading and swapping around. I have gotten quite a few really nice offers from you guys out there for some trading material and uh, I'm going to be making a decision on that very soon. In fact, uh, I'm going to be actually going out of town over this weekend. I've got a uh, conference I've got to go to at work. Uh, imagine that. I spend all my time on the road it seems like. But um, anyway, I, I'm going to be out of town but when I get back home I'm going to go through all that and we're going to make a decision on what we're going to swap these items for and, and I'll probably shoot a video and uh, show you guys what came in as offers just so you'll kind of know and, and talk a little bit about my thought process and, and how I came up with what I'm going to swap for. And right now my mind's not made up and I will say if you're interested go back and look at that other video if you haven't already um, and learn a little bit more about these tools and uh, if you would like to uh, offer something up for trade send me an email uh, my email address is right down here in this little strip. See it right down there? Yeah, okay. That's my email address. Uh, you can send me an email, send me some pictures of what it is, tell me what it is, and uh, it's not too late uh, to be considered for that. I will probably be making that decision here in the next week, and uh, again, we'll let you guys uh, see about it. A lot of the stuff that have been offered, man, there's been some really cool things, but unfortunately some of them are things that I already have and I really don't have a need for. Uh, I kind of got a couple of, of items that are at least in my mind right now at the top of the list, but there's still some things coming in. So I'm going to hold off again just a little bit longer. And, uh, but even if I had to make a choice today, I think I've got some really good options on what we're going to swap these for. And again, I'm looking for things that I can use. I'm not necessarily looking for something dollar for dollar uh, to trade for. I'm just looking for something that will be useful to me. Uh, that I can, uh, you know, I can put these tools that are extras, doubles, duplicates for me, put them in the hands of somebody that can use them, and maybe I can get something that I can use in return. That's all I'm after here. And, you know, it, it may be half the value of what this might be worth, uh, but if it's something I can use, it's worth it to me. So, anyway, we'll keep you guys in the loop on this as we move forward. All right, so to finish this video out, I think I'm going to share with you guys a couple of my favorite machine shop books that I have. I'm somewhat of a book collector. I've got a bunch of old uh, antique books of all kinds that I kind of keep and collect and, and just like to look through uh, uh, regarding all kinds of topics that are of interest to me. And machine shop stuff is definitely uh, one of those. And 
Uh, I know Adam Booth has been talking about some of the books that he has that he likes, and uh, Tom Lipton has actually talked about a couple of books. So I'm going to share with you guys some of my favorite uh, books that I have um, and just talk a little bit about them. So, uh, and actually, I grabbed those to put them in the screen, but we're going to start uh, with this one. So this book is called Advanced Machine Work by Robert H. Smith. Uh, this is a reprint uh, done by Lindsay Publications. Uh, which if you haven't ever checked those guys out, uh, they've got a website, uh, at least I think they still have one. I've been buying books from these guys from 25, 30 years, I guess. Uh, when I was a teenager, uh, back in the early 80s, I found these guys and used to get the little paper catalogs back pre-internet, pre-World Wide Web, uh, when you, know, you actually got a piece of paper to look through. And, I would sit up in my room, uh, you know, and look at these old books, and I'd save my money up and send off and order these books, and 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 because I just really enjoyed reading them. Uh, you know, things were a little bit tougher back then when you didn't have the internet of finding resources for uh, now. All this stuff you can just get online. A lot of it you can. But this, when I started working in the machine shop in the mid to late '80s, uh, I was looking for some references that I could use to learn from, and and of course I remembered. Uh, Lindsay had some stuff in theirs, and I ordered a copy of this book. And uh, this book was originally published in 1925, uh, but it's got some really good techniques in here. Uh, yeah, a lot of the, a lot of the stuff in here is kind of old school, but I'm kind of an old school machinist, always have been. Uh, so it's been very helpful to me. Uh, and I can remember when I first started working in the machine shop, I would literally at night in my bed, I would fall asleep at night thumbing through these books and reading up on things and when I, a problem would come up in the shop that I needed to figure out this was the book that I very often went to uh, to try to figure it out and I, it was a great reference for me learning the trade of a machinist um, and I recommend it to others for that same thing um, this is not the actual copy that I had when I was um, back in the 80s. I, some, well, I think when I was in college, I, somehow or another, my original one that I had got lost and um, I missed it so much. I, there was literally times when a problem would come up and I would remember something that I had read in this book, you know, at that time, probably 10 or 15 years earlier. And like, man, I wish I had that book. And I finally uh, found another copy of it. I think uh, it was, I, I got it from Lindsay again. They had it back in print again at a later date. This, the, my original one had a brown cover on it. I remember it vividly. This one's got a red cover, but uh, I still refer to this book from time to time on just all kinds of stuff. And a uh, great book, again, Advanced Machine Work by Robert H. Smith. But be aware, there's a lot of books with the title Advanced Machine Work out there. And I'm not necessarily saying one's better than the other. This is just the one that I have, or one of the ones that I have. And to prove that point, uh, here's another book. Let me zoom that out just a little bit. Maybe get all this in the frame. So, look at here. Okay, maybe not advanced machine work. This one is modern machine practice, machine shop practice. Okay, modern machine shop practice uh, by Joshua Rose, M.E. And, uh, you know, Adam showed a book the other day that was also by Joshua Rose. And Joshua Rose published a lot of books in the late 1800s, early 1900s on machine shop and all kinds of technical things like that. This is a neat one. This is an original one. This was, uh, this was a 1901 uh, version. When I got this book, I actually saw a reference to this book on the Internet. And this entire book is scanned on the Internet. You can find it, download it, look at it. Uh, all the way through, but I, 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 I saw it and I just thought it was a really neat book. Uh, it's got a lot of machine shop stuff in it, a lot of uh, design work in it. Uh, it's got a lot of steam related stuff, locomotive related stuff, stationary steam engines, uh, just all kinds of mechanical things in there. A lot of stuff that I come in contact with at the museum. And uh, anyway, I, I wanted to get a copy of this and I found a copy of it. The copy that I found, the pages are in pretty decent shape, uh, as you can see, but the binding on it was just absolutely ruined. I mean, it was just literally falling apart. So I did what 
a book collector would probably say never do, I had it rebound and uh, I put a brand new binding on it. A friend of mine uh, is a librarian uh, with the University of Georgia in their libraries and uh, they send a lot of books off, a lot of journals and stuff and get them bound. In fact, they usually at least once a month are sending a bunch of stuff off and he uh, actually sent this off with some of their stuff and uh, I paid for it separately of course, but um, he got it done at the university discount and uh, I got a brand new binding put on it. So again, from a book collector standpoint, that's probably not the best thing, but guys, when I buy a book, I don't buy it to put on a shelf and look pretty. I buy it to be able to open it up and use it. And the binding that was on it uh, was, I really couldn't do that. So uh, anyway, I'm, I'm glad to have this now where I can, I can use it. This is actually a two volume set. So there's, uh, you know, not only this one big, copy here but there's the volume two that goes along with it uh, and I have both originals okay. here um, lots of really cool information and, and again modern machine shop practice uh, you can find this book on the internet um, and you can browse through it I think it's on Google Books and uh, there's even some other websites I think that host this this uh, book where you can view it online so that was actually the one that I was talking about. There's multiple ones with the same title. So here we go, another modern machine shop practice. Uh, this one is by uh, Brooks and Hand. And uh, this one was published in 1906. Totally different, totally different book altogether. So this one is more like a textbook. And let me just zoom in a little bit closer there. We, maybe you guys can see this a little bit better. So this one is more like a textbook. And uh, this one be a great one for someone learning uh, that, you know, it starts with just the basics of science, the sciences behind uh, of some of the stuff you'd be doing in machine shop work. It talks about the tools that you need as a machinist and how to use them. And then it starts going into some basic projects. And I, I, if I remember right, this one actually has some like lessons that you can do and things that you can practice in the shop to learn techniques. And it also has a lot of instruction on just how to do different things. And another nice thing about this book is when you get in the back, it's almost it's another book in the back. I think it's by the same guys, but it's it's kind of two books in one: pattern making and foundry practice. And uh, I also do pattern making work and some foundry work. So this one, you know, also has some really good information in it. In fact, I probably refer to this book more for the pattern making than I have the machine shop stuff, um, but really got some good information in it. Another book I highly recommend. All right. Um, the other ones I want to mention are these Aldell's books. Um, and I've got, a, I've got a bunch of Aldell's books. I I've almost, I guess you could say, collect them. And these, but these are two that, uh, that have been real handy for machine shop work. One of them is uh, uh, The Machinist uh, and Tools and Maker's Handy Book and Toolmaker's Handy Book, and the other one is Audell's Mill Rights and a Mechanic's Guide. Uh, so both of these have been excellent books. Uh, these are kind of how-to books. Back in the uh, early 1900s, these guys, Audell's had books out to learn different, all kinds of different trades. Uh, they had mechanic books. I've got a whole set on uh, engines that are really more steam engine related. I mean, it's like a nine volume set or something like that. Uh, uh, that has been very helpful with doing the steam work. Um, but these are two uh, that have been real handy. Of course, the Machinist Handbook has got a lot of really good information in it. Uh, again, it's kind of a, a textbook um, to a certain extent on, you know, here we are on laying out, how to lay stuff out. Um, you know, I think back during World War II, here's something on scraping, uh, showing all these scraping tools. Uh, but anyway, back in during World War II, uh, the military used these Audell books to train uh, the people going to the military for these different tr uh, trades. So, for example, the uh, the steam engine books that I have, I, I knew a guy that worked in the, that was in the Navy, worked on the on ships and the boilers and the engines and on ships, and he said that was what he learned from. He said he still had his originals, and because of that, I actually bought a copy of those. And uh, anyway, I've used a lot of I use these a lot as well over the years. Great books. Uh, so the machinist one, 
And actually this Millwright's book is, has got some pretty good information in it too. And again, uh, more for machine setup. Uh, so if you're putting it together a shop, uh, you know, it's got a lot of carpentry type stuff in here, what have you, but it also talks about setting machines up and uh, there's some line shaft stuff in here which I found interesting Some, because uh, again out at the museum we do some line shaft work. Uh, so another, another good, good basic book to have. And the last one I want to show you guys uh, is a really neat book and you know this one isn't so much about uh, using machines but about the machines themselves. Uh, this is the serial number reference book for metalworking machines and I think this one is one of the last volumes that they published and it was published I think in the mid-1980s uh, but in this book it just lists all the different manufacturers of machine tool stuff and it has serial numbers and when they were made so uh, you know if you like old machinery like I do and always want to look stuff up this is a good book uh, to have and I this book is hard to find uh, I found it online somewhere along the lines a couple of years ago and actually when I worked in the machine shop my boss had this book and that's where I first found out about it and he bought several old machines over there and he would always look them up in his in his this book and I found one probably 10 or 12 years ago uh, so and I, if you got a machine that has a serial number metalworking machine that has a serial number and you want to look it up and see uh, what year it was made uh, shoot me an email uh, again right down here look right down here see there there's my email address send me an email tell me the manufacturer tell me the serial number and I will attempt to look it up in this book it doesn't have everything in it obviously but it has an awful lot in it so if you got a if wondering when a machine was made I'll be glad to try to look it up for you uh, just shoot me an email and we'll we'll look it up all right guys that wraps up this uh, edition of my shop talk video and uh, you know I hope you enjoyed that um, you know we'll try to get some more shop topic stuff up uh, uh, coming up here pretty quick um, got a lot going on uh, a lot of little small projects I've been working on as you've been seeing and I've been trying to shoot as much video as I can and uh, get those out where you guys can see what's going on so uh, if you like my videos uh, if you haven't already please subscribe to my channel uh, and that way you'll get a little email in when everything new is posted and you can keep track of what's going on around here and you know my whole purpose is I'm just sharing with you guys what I do and and uh, hopefully somewhere along the way maybe you can learn something from me and and at the same time maybe I can learn something from you so uh, I've said this many times you know I really enjoy your comments and I pick up tips from you guys all the time uh, when you send me in so you know if you got constructive criticism on how I do something I have no monopoly on, on knowledge when it comes to knowing how to do this stuff and I've said this many times before there's more than one way to skin a cat and particularly working in a machine shop or around tools and machinery uh, there's a million ways sometimes to do the same thing and uh, you know what may be the right way for me to do it may be not, not be the right way for you to do it depending on the tools and machinery that you have available to you uh, you know half the challenge in doing shop work is being able to figure out how to get something done with what you have. And uh, I'll show you guys how I get things done with what I have. But uh, if you got an idea, uh, by all means, you know, send me a comment uh, and do it in a constructive way. Uh, there's nothing that I guess makes anybody matter than for someone to just, you know, just say, hey, you're an idiot. That's not the right way to do that. Well, you know what? I'm not an idiot. Um, that's just the way I chose to do it based on the tools, the knowledge, whatever that I have. If you got a better way, by all means, let us know. And, uh, you know, we'll learn something from it. Everybody can learn something from it. And that's one of the great things about YouTube is you can go out here and see what's going on in other people's shops. I watch other people's videos uh, because I learn from them and uh, hopefully I can share some stuff with you guys as well. So subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, you know, send me some comments. Again, I read every one of them. I don't get a chance to reply to every one of them. It's just too many, but I, I do read each and every one, I promise. And, uh, you know, uh, just enjoy doing this and sharing with you guys, and I hope you guys get something out of it as well. Thank you so much.